And so I've got a few written down, and then if you have some more, uh, please uh, bring them to our attention. Uh, we need to remember Brother David Perkins. Um, he is uh, suffering from, I don't know if it was a reaction from his COVID shot, but he's got the shingles. And so he's got a pretty severe case, so remember him. Uh, we also need to remember uh, our Gina and my friend, Teresa Matthew. She's recovering from that brain tumor. Everything's going well, but just continue to pray for her. We need, need to remember Sister Norma. Uh, we need to remember Tricia Gothard for blood pressure. Uh, Janet, Jana Redinger, um, she's getting ready to go on the mission. Jeff and uh, Cassie are not here tonight because she's here tonight. She's going to San Antonio tomorrow. And then in a day or two, she's going to Panama on her missions uh, calling. So we need to remember Jana, uh, their daughter. Diana, Marvin's sister, need to remember her and uh, lift her up in prayer. How is she doing? Any news? She's doing just fine. She has very little pain. She's getting ready to start soon. Okay. Uh, we need to remember Brother Chuck um, as he's dealing with some things with his uh, legs, uh, Sister Robin, have they determined when they're going to do what they're going to do yet? Okay. Okay, well, we'll continue to pray for you. Are there any other prayer requests? Yes. Remember this, yes. Okay. Just allergies, virus, what do you know? Okay. So we'll remember them. Any other prayer requests? Anyone have any prayer requests you'd like to bring to the Lord? I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And then we will uh, uh, give you an opportunity to worship and giving. Heavenly Father, we, just, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy, Lord, for your loving kindness. God, we just exalt and praise your holy name, Father. And Lord, we thank you for all that you have done and all that you're doing in our midst. We pray for these, Lord, whose names we've called out to you. And we just ask that you administer to them your healing virtue, God, that you would touch and minister to their bodies and minister to their, their spirit, minister to their their soul father in the name of jesus christ your word says by his stripes we were we are healed and lord we receive that on their behalf and we speak this word over them lord for healing lord for protection god for deliverance whatever their need is whatever their situation we speak over them father in the name of jesus christ and we give you glory and honor and praise in his name and the church said amen amen, amen. if you have any tithe or offering you'd like to bring it bring at this time i'm going to ask you to go ahead and do so uh, with that, if you have your Bibles and you will turn to the book of John, chapter 11, uh, the book of John, chapter 11, uh, tonight we're going to be talking about resurrection power, um, which is relevant because we just uh, celebrated Easter Sunday, uh, Resurrection Sunday, but we're going to be looking at it uh, in John 11, verses 25 and 26. So I wanted to look at John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, and it's, if, if you need a little setup of where this is taking place, at, this is at the uh, graveside of Lazarus. This is where Lazarus has died, and Jesus is meeting with Mary and Martha and the family and those who are uh, grieving, and Jesus comes to the graveside, graveside and he has a conversation with uh, Martha and Mary and he says in verse 25 I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me though he may die he shall live and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe this I'm going to ask you to bow your head we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and then we're going to look at resurrection power father we just thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your mercy we thank you God uh, for your Holy Spirit who is speaking to us and through us, Father. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would accomplish your purpose and your will in, in my life, in our life, Lord, that I would say only that which you would have me to say. And Lord, that you, 
uh, would speak to the, through the Holy Spirit, the, the ears of the hearers, that they would receive the word that you are speaking to us this evening. We give you glory and honor and praise in the name of Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen. Amen. So in our walk with Jesus Christ, in your walk, in my walk with Jesus Christ, it's, some, it's, it's a lot of times for believers, it's easier to accept the spiritual things that God has given us than it is the physical things. From, for instance, if you say, well, what are you talking about, Pastor Kurt? Uh, what I'm talking about is, is for someone who accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, uh, salvation is easy, easier, uh, it seems like, it's easier to accept than a physical healing. You understand what I'm saying? We can, we can very readily accept the fact that Jesus came to die for our sin and cleanse us of our sin, but it, it, for whatever reason in our life or in our existence in this walk, sometimes it's harder for us to believe that He'll heal our physical body. And the truth is, everything that He came to do, He came to do body, soul, and spirit. He came to say, and the most important is the spiritual, Absolutely. And we talk about, and the two things that we major in is we major in the spiritual, and then we slide over to the physical, and we forget about the soul. And the soul is what goes on up here. And I want to tell you, that's one of the biggest issues that, at least in the United States of America, we face is the challenges of our mind. Um, not, before COVID ever hit, man, we all had to stay home and wear masks wear masks and you can't tell if someone's mad or sad because you can't see if they're smiling or frowning or sticking their tongue out at you because they got a mask on you know um, before that several years ago I worked at the pharmacy in Sam's in Missouri and I was shocked and I'm, I'm not crossing any HIPAA lines because I'm not pointing out anybody I was shocked at the number of prescriptions that were prescribed for people who for their anxiety for their mental issues for, because they couldn't cope because they, and I'm not I'm not raining down on those folks because I'm gonna tell you something in the world we live in it's hard not to be anxious it's hard not to be fearful it's hard listen I don't I I used to be a lover of the news I don't I can't tell you when the last time I watched the news whether national or local I just refuse to watch it anymore because I I I, I don't like what they're pushing they're they're almost as bad as the drug dealers they're pushing fear and anxiety and, and all this stuff and angst on us. And, and, and I just don't need it in my life. And the Bible says to be anxious for nothing, uh, but in all things, giving thanks. You know, So uh, in this life, we need to look at the, the miracles that God, through Jesus Christ, has provided for His church. And as we examine the life of Jesus Christ... His ministry was one that was filled with physical manifestations of His power as well as, well as the spiritual insights, the spiritual revelations, and all the miracles that were ministered by Christ brought glory to the Father. And I'm going to tell you that when the church, when the body of Christ moves in what I call resurrection power, or king, you can even say kingdom power, or kingdom dynamic, when the church begins to move in the ways of God, we bring glory to not the church in and of itself, but to God. We are, we are called to glorify God and to bring glory to God. And Jesus told us, you know, if we, we bear much fruit, that we're bringing glory to God. And so uh, when we see supernatural things that take place in life, when we see, and I'm going to say, uh, and this is the truth, salvations are supernatural things. It's a supernatural birth. And when we see salvations, people getting saved, that's a, that's a supernatural thing. That's a God thing. When we see a complete and total miraculous healings or deliverances, uh, bondages set free, those are supernatural things. When we see someone who struggles with, with, with fear or with uh, anxiousness or, or, or worry, and we see them delivered of that mindset and they have the mind of Christ and they trust in the Lord, that's a supernatural thing. That's not, not something you can will to be done or you can work to be done. That is accepting God's truth for your life or, or for others. And so that glorifies God. And so the purpose, number one, the purpose of resurrection power, turn to somebody and say there is a purpose for resurrection power. There was a purpose for resurrection power. Now, if you're not, I hope you get the gist of this, but what I'm saying is resurrection power is the power that Jesus Christ walked in after his resurrection. Now, he walked in the power prior to, but the difference is, I would consider is this. After the resurrection, it was poured out on the disciples in Acts chapter 2. 
We call it Pentecost. Okay, and so if we're, and, and I said this Sunday, I think Gina said it uh, behind the, she didn't know where I was coming from, that it was going to be in my message, and, and she, she quoted it, but the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and I as believers, that same spirit, that same Holy Ghost that raised him from the dead lives in you and I, and he is actively working in our life as we allow him to, and he is the resurrection power. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the purpose of resurrection power is for the glory of God. And so when we look at this, if you look at verses 1 through 6 in John chapter 11, it talks about a certain man who was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and his sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil, wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, when Jesus said it, he full well knew that Lazarus was going to die before he got there. In fact, he delayed. Now, how many of you would be happy with Jesus if you knew that you were sick and you called for him and he was your friend, but he didn't come right away? In fact, he waited three days. Jesus declared to his disciples in the beginning, this sickness is not unto death, but it's to, to the glory of God. It's for the glory of God. And so when we walk in resurrection power, it is so that God will receive the glory and death will not receive any glory. Um, so uh, the Bible says in verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Verse 6, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Two more days. He stayed there. He didn't immediately get up and move. Now, Jesus Christ, he knows full well what's going to happen. He knows what's going on. You know, it's, it's interesting that God knows. We get frantic sometimes because we don't know. We get upset because we're not in control. But we have to have faith and believe that God is in control. God doesn't give us control. We yield. Part of being a Christian is yielding control of my life to God. Control, I've said it over and over again, control is an illusion. You don't really have control. You've never had control of your life. Your control goes as far, if you're driving down the interstate, your control goes as far as the end of your bumper because you have no control over the 15 to 30 cars around you racing down Interstate 20 at 70 miles an hour. And I know that some of them go 90 because I'll be going 75 or 80 and they go boom right by me. You have no control over them. You don't have control over, over what's taking place. Listen, one of the, one of the I, it wasn't funny, but it was, uh, uh, I would say it was uh, a situation where you look at that and go, huh, one of the most fit people in the United States, he was the one who revolutionized back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, into the 80s, the, the, what they called jogging and running. His name was Jim Kick. He wrote a book about it. He died of a heart attack. At a fairly young age, he was trying to be in the best health that he could. He was maintaining a healthy lifestyle, uh, you know, trying to take care of his body. But what happened? His heart said, mm, nope, and he's gone because he had no control of it. You can control what you eat, and I'm not saying you shouldn't control what you eat and eat right and eat good. I will testify in this place tonight. I have a witness that I ate a green bean yesterday. I tried it, one, a half of one, if we're being real uh, honest about it. But Gina had fixed some new stuff, and, and uh, she, it was roasted, and she, uh, she, asked, she had something going on. So she said, would you put those in the oven? And when I put them in, I was like, I'm going to have to try one of those. Just because I always say I won't try them, but I did try one. I ate one. I did swallow it, or half of one. I think it's important that we try to live healthy, Okay. We try to do the right things, but in, in, in the end, we have to trust God because God is in control. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 through 57, uh, speaking on the fact that death will not receive glory, uh, it says, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is the victory? The, the strength of death is sin, 
The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ knew no sin, neither was there any guile found in him. He knew that death uh, could not, or would not glory in the sickness of Lazarus because he, the resurrection, was going to show up. So the reason that we want to walk in this resurrection power is to glorify God. So de death wasn't going to glorify in this situation, but we want to bring glory to God because that brings glory to Christ. John 3 and 31 says, Christ glorified by redeeming man. The Father's glorified by Christ's walk. Both are glorified in uh, seeing ruined work redeemed and restored. Can I tell you that when God looks on you, he is looking on the, his workmanship? He created you. You are his workmanship. He formed you. He fastened you. The, the, the psalmist David, when he wrote the psalm, he said, you, you knew me when I was being formed in my mother's womb. You knew me. Before I was even much of anything, you knew who I was. You see, he acknowledged that God was a part of his creative life, his crea the creative process of his life. And so God wants to see a ruined work redeemed and restored, and that is the work of humanity that fell in the garden. And so uh, we, we look at John uh, uh, 13. I think it's 13. And verse 31 says, So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. And so we, we see that God desires, and what does this have to do with you and I? I'm talking about walking in resurrection power or resurrection power. What does it have to do with us? Well, as the church, we are the body of Christ. He's the head, we're the body. And the things that we do should bring glory to Christ. Whatever, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get down to the brass tacks or where the rubber meets the road. Every ministry of any church, if it's not bringing glory to God through Jesus Christ, it's not a valid ministry of the church. If we're not bringing glory to God through Jesus Christ, we are the body of Christ, then it, it's just empty works. We're not, a, we're not a country club. We're not a social club. I believe in fellowship, and I believe in fellowshipping. But everything that we do, everything that goes on that is a part of any church, not just this church, it ought to be glorifying God. There's a lot of ways to do that. The Bible says you give a cup of cold water in the name of a prophet, you're going to receive a prophet's reward. So if we give, if we give a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus Christ, if we're ministering in the name of Jesus Christ to the needs around us, then we are doing the work of Christ. We're ministering the work of Christ. But it has to be something that brings Him glory. Not just something that makes us feel good about ourselves. Not just something that we think is a good work. There's a lot of good works, but there's not a lot of God works going on in the church today. And we need God works. We need things that God's in. I want to be a part of something that God is doing. I want to be a part of something that God has put his, uh, that God, this is what I want done, and his stamp of approval is, is upon it. So many times, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, so many times that we find what we want to do and then ask God to put his stamp of approval rather than finding what God wants us to do so that we already know his stamp of approval will be on it. God doesn't line up with us. We line up with Him. God doesn't line up with our will, our direction, our purpose, our desire. We are to line up with God's will, God's purpose, God's direction, and God's desire. And if we're going to walk in resurrection power, we have to walk in the power uh, uh, acknowledging that it is all Him. It is from Him. It is by Him. It is in Him. And it is for Him. We have, this, we have this issue of uh, works and grace, works and grace, faith and works, grace and works. And the truth is, works should come, they are a byproduct of our faith. If we say we have faith and we don't have works, our faith is dead, according to the book of James. All right? 
There's a lot of that going around in the church today. There's a lot of people say they believe. There's a lot of people think they're going to heaven, but they ain't doing nothing in the kingdom. Faith without works is dead. What that means is this. If you say you have faith and you're not doing anything, kingdom mentality, kingdom wise, resurrection power, your faith is dead. You don't really believe. That's what, I didn't go, don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me and turn me off. That is what the book of James says. If we say we believe and we truly believe, then we're going to be actively doing the work of the kingdom because we believe it. Because it's real in us. And, and that, Lord help me. We want resurrection power. Everybody wants to stand at the grave of Lazarus and see the dead rise again. We want to walk in the authority of the kingdom, but we're not willing to do the work of the kingdom. We're not willing to do the work of the resurrection power. Here's, here's most Christians today. Most of us are like this. Jesus comes to the graveside and he's going to resurrect. And we're all sitting there going, ooh, I want to see this. We don't want to participate in it. We just want to see it. Because most of us are just, we're just looking for the reason to shout and rejoice. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with shouting or rejoicing. But you are are the body of Jesus Christ today. We are the body of Jesus Christ today. And if we don't walk up to the graveside and say, move the stone, who's going to? The church down the street? Now, this is scaring some of you to death. But it's dealing with our faith. We either believe in resurrection power or we don't believe in resurrection power. We celebrated Jesus rose from the dead. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. We love the song. I love the song. It gives me cold chills when I hear it. Whether Dolly Parton sing it or someone else. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. And they show an empty tomb and go, yes! Rejoice in resurrection power and fail to realize that same power is within us calling us to do the work of the kingdom of Jesus Christ right here, right now, today. Now, I can hear you. I can hear you. Somebody saying, are you saying we're supposed to raise the dead? If the Lord moves on you, yes. Absolutely. Don't think we're the only church that believes in that. I heard Dr. Tony Evans talking a couple of years ago. And he was talking about, I think it was his, uh, it was his daughter-in-law or someone just, just real close to his family had passed away. And he, he was preaching and he said, you know, I went in and I asked the Lord to bring her back. And he didn't. And he said, this is, these were his words, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, I've done that before and it's happened. He wasn't bragging on it. I'm just telling you, the brother was saying that he had prayed for someone and brought them back from the dead. I've heard other men who have talked about that but i'm going to tell you something it's not it's not just preachers who are supposed to be people in the power of resurrection it's the body of jesus christ because we can't be everywhere i had an evangelist we were in south texas he was about as rough as a cob you know what that means he wasn't polished at all. He had had a rough life. And when he stood and preached, he talked a lot of scripture. And then he would tell stories and, and, and people responded. And he was telling a story about his brother and he. They had just got saved, just filled with the Holy Spirit. They were living in California. And there was a major accident across the, the, the road from where they were so they pulled over ran across traffic jumped the median the emts are just getting there 
doctor, and they're, they're working on the guy, and they're pronouncing him dead. And as they're working on him, he and his brother come up and begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, trying to get close to him, lay hands on him, and the people are saying, you need to get out of here, you need to get out of here. And they're saying, we're just trying to pray for him. We're, we're, we're trying to, to, to touch God for him. And they were praying for him, and the guy was dead, and they called it there at the scene. They continued to pray for him. They load him in, in the ambulance. We're going to take him to the hospital. Got to the hospital. The man came back to life. They followed the ambulance to the hospital. Didn't know. They were praying for the guy. Just felt led of the Holy Spirit. They walked into the hospital. And they heard the guy talking. And they, the, he said, where's those two that were praying for me? And the EMTs went and got him and brought him into the, into the room and said, these two guys? He said, yeah, I, I recognize you. And they said, you can't recognize, the EMT said, you can't recognize them. You never opened your eyes. He said, no, you don't understand. I was above my body. I was out of my body. I was going away. And they were praying in the language of God, and they called me back, and he sent me back. You see, we need to live in resurrection power. We need to realize that God has called us to be His, the extension of Jesus Christ. So that death doesn't have glory. So that God is glorified through us in Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what else it does is builds the faith of believers around you. It builds the faith of believers around you. I, I, I want to tell you this. I, I don't laugh at people's faith. If someone tells me they're believing for something, I'm not going to laugh at it. I'm not going to scoff at it. Because God will do what you have the faith to believe for. God will do what you, what you have the faith to believe for. Verse 11 through 14 in John chapter 11. 11 through 14 says this. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him. Now he was talking to his disciples. This is before he got to the graveside. They don't have understanding. He's told them they know that Lazarus is sick. And he's told them this is not unto death, but it's to glorify God. And then the, he waits for two days more. Before he leaves, and before he leaves, he tells them, he said, look, our friend Lazarus, he's asleep. Well, if he's just asleep, things are okay. He's doing all right. No, you don't understand. He's dead. Sometimes you just got to be playing with people because there's no understanding. He's not alive. He's dead. Verse 14. Because verse 13, his disciples, verse 12, said, Lord, if he sleeps and he'll get well. Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them, verse 14, Lazarus is dead. Now verse 15, I probably blew him out of the water. It would have me in that moment. He says, I'm glad he's dead. He didn't say it in that, those words, but this is what he said. I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there, that you may believe. Nonetheless, let us go to him. What he was saying is, I'm glad this happened. So I can show you something. I'm glad this happened so you can have an experience that you wouldn't have happened, ha been able to have had this not happened. Now listen, God had already, or Jesus had already told them, this is not a sickness unto death. They probably took that to mean Lazarus is going to be okay. There's no rush. When Jesus said he's sleeping, their response was, oh, he'll get better. If he's resting, then he's going to get well. And Jesus said, no, you don't understand. He's dead. Wait a minute, I wonder if they thought, wait a minute, you just said, just a few verses up, you just said that this sickness wasn't unto death, but that to glorify God. And now Lazarus, you're telling us Lazarus is dead, and you're telling us you're glad about it. Make up your mind. What they didn't understand was this was going to build their faith. They were going to see something that had never happened before. Now, it's important that we understand that in the Jewish belief, in the Jewish tradition, they don't do like we do. They don't leave a body laying for a day or two or three and bury it on the third or fourth day. They bury a body immediately in the Middle East. Even today, 
many of them, the day that person passes, they have mourning, and then they put them in the ground or in, in, the, in the tomb or wherever they're going to put them. They, they bury them. They, they, they do it quickly, traditionally, because of the heat. I mean, the body just decay really quick. But they also had a belief, the Jews had a belief in the time of Jesus Christ and even before that, that the spirit of a person hung around for two to three days before it went either to heaven or hell. But on the third day, when physical decay was really set in, they believed that it was gone, it was too late. So Jesus gets to the grave of Lazarus. And he has this whole discourse with his sisters. Lord, if you had been here, if he, he would have lived. If, he would, if you had just come, he would have lived. And Jesus says, well, don't you believe that I'm the, re- I'm the resurrection? Don't, don't you believe in the resurrection? Yes, I believe at the end, in the last day, that, that the righteous are going to rise. He said, no, I am the resurrection. That's what he was saying. I am the resurrection and the life. So, when we move in 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 resurrection power, when a believer moves in resurrection power, it affects the faith of those around. It's faith that saves. John three sixteen says, Whosoever believes should not perish. It's faith that heals. Matthew 9 and 22. He says, Be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. Uh, it's faith that conquers death. John 11, verse 25 and 26, as we've read earlier. As I've stated, we, we've celebrated Easter, and we're in the time between uh, the crucifix, crucifixion, resurrection, and the ascension, and then comes Pentecost Sunday. It's a 50-day period between uh, Easter and or Resurrection Sunday and the day of Pentecost, which was one of the feasts in Israel. It's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus walked for 40 days. They stayed 10 days in the upper room waiting for the promise from the Father. Now, they weren't, they weren't walking in resurrection power until right at Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit was poured out. They had done things. That, now, watch this because it's important. The disciples had walked in authority. They had walked in the authority of Christ. They had cast out devils in Jesus' name. They had been with Jesus when he did the miraculous. But you don't read a whole lot of, of, of instances where the disciples did healings when they were walking with Jesus. We read a whole lot about what Jesus did, but we don't read where the 12 did any healings. Jesus was the one doing it, right? But if after Acts chapter 2, we see some supernatural, miraculous healings at the hands of the apostles, the disciples, the church, because they then begin, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, begin to walk in the resurrection power of Christ because the Holy Spirit was poured out. Okay, and so for the faith of the believer, we need to walk, for those around us, we need to walk in resurrection power so that others will hear and believe and see. You ever wonder why, what miracles are for? Why do you think Jesus did miracles? Just, just think about that. Why do you think Jesus did the miracles? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what I think. You can agree or disagree. Number one, I think he did miracles because people were suffering and he had compassion on them. The Bible tells us he was moved with compassion. Secondly, I think that he did miracles to increase their faith, to establish that God was indeed among them, Emmanuel, God with us in the form of Jesus Christ. He, he was establishing some things with humanity in that moment that were going to change the dynamic of how we worship God. He was the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the earth. And he's walking walking among the people and there's those who are hurting there's listen he met every need if you read the the book uh the four gospels there was i don't know that there's a need that was there that wasn't met i mean he raised the dead lazarus wasn't the only one there were a couple other situations uh he fed the multitudes listen he fed the hungry he fed the hungry and we ought to be feeding the hungry Woo! hello well, to be uh, that's that's part of what Jesus did. 
He cast out devils. He wasn't afraid of the enemy. He opened blinded eyes. He caused the lame to walk. Hang on. He had a supernatural love that went to the place where they brought a woman who was caught in the act of adultery and he said, go and sin no more. I'm not going to condemn you. He was, he was showing a supernatural love above the love that we humans can innately give of ourselves. We can't do that. We're governed by our own. We're dictated by our own rules. He wasn't ba- Jesus wasn't bound by a, a, a social or, or racial profiling. The woman at the well. She was Samaritan. They were hated among the Jews. Jesus called her food that you don't know that I have. When he ministered to her and she believed and went and got the rest of the, the city, he said, I, you got to meet a man that's told me everything I've done. And they're probably thinking, woo, he told you a whole lot. Because she had done a whole lot. But Jesus didn't hold that against her. He just said, you need to be better. And I'm the one that can help you be better. And he made her better through her faith. Listen, he went out of his way. He crossed a, a stormy sea to meet one man who was possessed with a legion of devils to set him free. I mean, he did these things. These are the the works of Jesus Christ. And just a a, a brief cross-section. We, the church, ought to be doing these things because Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. And if we believe that we are the body of Jesus Christ. If you're part of the church and we're part of the church, and I'm not just talking about the church of God, I'm talking about the Bible-believing Christian church in the world today that crosses denominational lines of all those who believe in the Word of God and the Spirit of God, then we ought to be doing the work of Jesus Christ in the power of Jesus Christ. We're called to do that. Why, why are we called to do that? Why should we move in resurrection power? For the love of humanity. For the love of humanity. John, John 11, verse 35. Actually, verse 34, they said, where have you laid him? He, he, gets, to the, he gets to the cemetery. He gets to the cemetery, and he says, where is he? Where have you laid him? And they said, come and see. Now, they're not saying come and see him. They're saying come and see the place where he's laid. Come and, come and look at his gravestone. Come and look at the, the tomb where he's been entoured. He's been in there three days. Come and see. And the next verse, when Jesus got there, is real short. It says, Jesus wept. There's a lot of discussion about that short verse in the Bible. There's discussion as to the fact that Jesus loved Lazarus and, and Mary and Martha and that, you know, that, that he had died. Now, I'm not of the opinion that he cried because Lazarus died. Because he, he knew he was about to raise him. So why would he be crying over his death? I think that he was crying over the pain that his family had to go through. The hurt that it caused them. The suffering that, that because of death. That, that's my belief. You see, God's love is unchangeable. John 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour should, uh, had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. God's love for humanity is unchangeable. God's love for you is unchangeable. Now, if we, if we compare God's love to our love, our love is changeable. We can change our affection, our love. We, uh, there, <laughs> I've seen people 
who one minute are loving somebody and the next minute because they did something they didn't like, they're hating them. That's a humanistic, ungodly type of love. It's not God's love. Because God loves us whether we're doing wrong or doing right. I didn't say he accepted your wrong. I'm just saying he loves you in spite of your wrong. He loves me in spite of my wrong. Because God's love is unchangeable. He's, God's not a fickle God. He's not blowing around with, with the wind. He's not blown around by how you act. He still loves you. God's love is inseparable. Romans 8, verse 35 through 39 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? None of these things can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God's love is is divine john 15 and 9 the love of god is is a love that is it, it supersedes our understanding john 15 and 9 says this as the father loved me i also have loved you abide in my love god's love is self sacrificing john 15 and 13 says this greater love is no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends God's love was manifested by his death. 1 John, if you turn over to 1 John. Chapter 3, verse 16. By this we know love. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is how we know love. That's what John is saying. This is how we know love. Because he laid down his life for us. As we also ought to lay down our lives for us brethren you see the resurrection power of christ was manifested in the raising of lazarus despite the discouragement despite discouragement that lived or existed or in the situation verses 7 and 8 in john 11 tells us this and after he said this to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? You see, they had left Judea because the religious leaders sought to stone them, Jesus, because of his teachings. And they had taken a reprieve from that, and they were in a, a place where that they, their reach didn't extend. And all of a sudden, they're going back. Have you ever went back into the lines then? Had to walk in some churches that felt like a lion's den. Because there were a lot of roaring and a lot of tacking going on. And sometimes you have to walk back into the lion's den and trust that God's going to keep you. And despite the discouragement of someone saying, you're going back down there, you're going to go back in there again, but you're going to do that again. I'm going to go where God has called me to go and I'm going to do what God has called me to do. I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about us. It may not be easy to walk back into your place of work. It may not be easy to walk back into a, a family member's home. But you, perhaps you're the only light and salt in that person's life. And, and perhaps God puts you in that very spot to make a difference among those people. And if we say, you know what, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. I'm going to, so let someone else do that. What happens to those people? What happens to your call and my call to walk in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ? We can't be afraid of the discouragement. And we cannot fear death. And turn to your neighbor and say, don't be afraid of death. Don't be afraid of death. Don't be afraid of death. Fear is a debilitating thing. Fear is a debilitating thing. I'm coming up on an anniversary. That anniversary is going to be June the 6th, I think. June the 6th of 2020. I wasn't just dealing with COVID issues. I sneezed seven times. Not a joke. I sneezed seven times on that Wednesday morning. And couldn't move. Couldn't walk. My legs didn't work the way they were supposed to. I 
caught myself on the kitchen sink. Gina was in the back bedroom getting ready for the day. When I caught myself with my arms on the kitchen sink because my legs gave way, I'm going to tell you a fear came across my body, Brother Jose. I don't know if I've ever, maybe one other time I felt a fear like that because I didn't know what was going on. I tried to stand up and fell flat down back on that sink. And I'm hollering at Gina, you got to come in here. She slides a chair under me, and I don't know how I'm going to move because I can't walk, and I'm pretty sure she can't carry me. She's strong, but she ain't that strong. And he went from bad to worse. She took me to the ER here, Baylor Scott and White. They didn't have the equipment, so they had to send me by ambulance to Waxahachie. Got to the, and understand, it's COVID. I didn't want to be in the emergency room either. Got there, and I, I have a respect for doctors, but there's one that ought not be doctoring, and I got him. He said, uh, you need to turn over on your side. I need to check and see what's wrong. And he took his hand and mashed down my spine, and I was screaming, and I was crying. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm not a crier. The pain was horrific. He said he was going to do something to me, and I said, you're not going to touch me right now. I was crying. I looked at Gina and said, I need you to quote Psalm 91. Because if, if, if I don't hear the word, I ain't going to make it. We started quoting Psalm 91. Then they decided they were going to stick me in a, in a little tube. I'd never been claustrophobic. But they gave me something that was antipsychotic. I wasn't having a psychotic ap- episode. I was in pain. It sent me over the edge, Sister Luella. I mean, literally over the edge. I hit that button. You got to get me out of here. He said, we were not done. We got to get a full body. We got to get your whole spine. I said, I'm going home. He said, you, you, let me get your wife. She came in there, and I was trying to get up. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting out of here. Fear was raging in my mind. And she said, no, you, you, how are you going to get out? You can't get out of here. You can't walk. Well, if I have to crawl, I'll crawl, but I'm getting out of here. And she looked at the man and said, this is not my husband. I don't know what you guys gave him, but this ain't right. And I believe it was the, the drugs that they had given me. I couldn't control it. I feel like I'm in control. I feel like I'm pretty much in control of my emotions because I'm not a real emotional person. I'm going to tell you something. I was out of control. And fear was overwhelming me. I'm thankful for my wife because even if she wasn't saying anything, she reached down and grabbed my hand and I just felt like it'd be all right. Because I knew she knew the word, and I knew she was praying. We cannot allow fear to rule. Because when fear rules, we make bad choices and decisions. We're not making faith-based decisions. We're making fear-based decisions. And those are not God-based decisions. I was leaving. I was, I was done. I was ready to go. I was afraid. I wasn't going back in there. I'll tell you what, they gave me some happy, happy juice. I didn't care what they did at that point. But the thing I'm trying to get across here is we cannot allow the fear of anything, not death, not sickness, not disease. We have to embrace 
faith in God regardless of our situation. John 11 and 16. And Thomas, who is called the twin, said to the, his fellow disciples, let us, go also, let us also go that we may die with him. I talked about it Sunday morning. Thomas wasn't afraid. He was a man of courage. He wasn't afraid to face death if that's what it called for. If that's what it called, if walking with the master called for death, then he was willing to walk that path. The last thing that we need to recognize is that doubt fights against the resurrection power. Verse 39 and 40 of John 11, Jesus says, roll the stone away. Move that stone. Go ahead, push that away. Just, just move it out of the way. The objection was this, by one of Lazarus' sisters. Lord, he stinks. It's been three days. Decay has set in. Surely he stinketh. That's King James. By this time, decay set in. Lord, he's stinking. He's not, he's not smelling good. Some said in verse 37, Could not the, this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Jesus groaned in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was laid against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that I, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Didn't I say to you that if you just had faith, God could... He would do whatever you have faith to believe. And then Jesus utters those, those words that we, we get excited about. Lazarus. I have preachers say this, and I wonder. I don't know. But I wonder, had he not said Lazarus, had he just said, come forth, if all the graves would have busted open. That he had to, because he was the he is the resurrection and the life. And had he not said Lazarus, every grave in that graveyard, every grave around the world would have kicked open because the resurrection said, Come forth. Hmm. One of these days, we're gonna hear a shout. We're gonna hear a trumpet. And we're going to hear a call. I, I believe it's going to be like this. And I believe he's going, if you're ready, he's going to call your name. I know he's going to call my name. This is what I'm going to hear. You're going to hear what I'm going to hear, what I believe I'm going to hear. Kurt! Come on up! This ain't the price is right. This is glory. I believe he's going to call us by name. Well, how can he do that to all of us? He's God. He can do whatever he wants to. How does he speak to all of us? He's God, his spirit. But I believe he's going to call and we're going to come up. I'm going to ask you to stand. We, I, and I want to challenge you to walk in resurrection power. I want to challenge you to walk in the power of of the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, from now to Sunday, make it your prayer when you get up and when you lay down. Lord, help me to walk in your resurrection power. Help me to recognize opportunities to minister kingdom authority and power and might to those who are hurting, to those who are in need. Help me, God, to be Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, to those around us. Would you join me in prayer? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you and we praise you, God, for your goodness and your mercy, Lord, for your loving kindness. And God, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would help us to walk in that resurrection power. That's